Good morning. And welcome. Glad to see you here this morning. We're continuing our series on Matthew by uh, beginning, starting in, on the Sermon of the Mount, which is in Matthew chapter 5. If you have Bibles, go ahead and open them up there. All right. Although there is sermonic structure, there is an introduction, there's points, there's a conclusion and a call to action uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in my belief, and some others agree with me, um, that it's really a composite of Jesus' teachings uh, rather than a verbatim recording of one of his sermons, right? That is to say, the event recorded here in Matthew is an actual event, but it's not like Matthew, you know, was sitting in the front pew and writing down everything Jesus said on that day. Uh, maybe he was, but in all likelihood, because Matthew was with Jesus during those three years of public ministry, he heard these things that Jesus taught um, probably over and over again. And again, this probably was a sermon, or was a sermon that Jesus preached, but um, Matthew, you know, wrote with a specific audience, specific purpose, and, and wrote these teachings down. It's paralleled somewhat in, and shorter in Luke, but uh, again, the teachings here that we know, we're familiar with, um, that Matthew and the disciples were familiar with, are teachings that Jesus probably throughout those three years dripped and percolated uh, during his ministry rather than just a one-time sermon. Like he didn't just say this and then be done with it and move on to other stuff. There's the things that are over and over again. I've heard, I've preached numerous sermons and while one or two may stand out to me, I don't remember exactly what the pastor said. Sometimes on Wednesday, I don't remember what I said on Sunday, which is rather embarrassing. Uh, I remember meeting with my mentor one time, what'd you talk about on Sunday? And it was a Wednesday lunch. So I'm like, uh, and he goes, well, if you can't remember, do you think the people remember? No. Anyway, uh, most people don't remember things that are said once, but rather things that are said repeatedly, right? That's why you have to tell kids over and over again, pick up your room, pick up your toys, don't hit your sister, don't hit your brother. She did that until I was big enough to defend myself. And then, <laughs> <sighs> Anyway, memory and comprehension are found in repetition. For instance, I repeatedly say it's a process, not a procedure. Yeah, apparently I need to say it a few more times here. But uh, yeah, change is a process, not a, a procedure. Catchphrases are remembered, not the whole dialogue. Uh, some of you will remember hearing this live as it was spoken. Here's one, right? And that's the way it is. Walter Cronkite, yeah. I don't, you don't remember hearing that though, right? Really? Wow. How about good night, John boy? Yeah, you know one of the most dramatic things, traumatic or most difficult to accept things for me as a kid was when John boy went off to war. Like what? Yeah, Richard Thomas, who played John Boy, starred in a series, All Quiet on the Western Front. And I thought, man, what's, what's John Boy doing fighting in this war? <laughs> it's confusing for me. All right, something a little more contemporary, but not quite too much. How are you doing? <laughs> Joey Triviani, right, from Friends. Ah, we would have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for you meddling kids. Every villain in Scooby-Doo, yeah, that get caught. Oh, this is a good one. Well, isn't that special? Church lady from Saturday Night Live. Yeah. yeah. We used to do an outreach to a neighborhood near the church there, and uh, when they closed the community center, tore it down, we still went and walked around, did stuff for the kids. And I remember one of the kids, it was, I'm sorry to bring this up, honey, but it was one of the more traumatic things. But hey, at least he recognized you, right? Pointed at Becky and goes, church lady. <laughs> Embarrassing, but uh, I'll be back. Hasta la vista, baby. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Go ahead, make my day. Right? We remember these: the Terminator, the Godfather, Dirty Harry. They're all catchphrases from television and movies over the years. But it's not just catchphrases that stick in our memories. It is concepts, ideas, teachings. If I say the Great Commandment, what do you think? What? Love. Yeah. 
the great commandment, love God, love others. That's a summation of that. Uh, how about the Ten Commandments? You may not remember all ten of them or be able to list them, but you know these are rules. This is the box that God gave uh, his people to play in. These are the rules to follow. And I've used the, the ex, uh, example guardrails. Right? God put the Ten Commandments as guardrails because if you go past those, there's a big cliff you're going to fall off. And so he's trying to stop you from going over that cliff. It's a way to live life. Ten Commandments, rules from God. So over the time they had together with Jesus and after he was gone, the disciples surely thought about and discussed the things that he taught, uh, including the things on the Sermon on the Mount. And we discuss it still today, obviously. We're still talking about it. We're reading our Bible. We know these things. Uh, you know, what does it mean to be salt and light? What is it, uh, you know, mental adultery, if you will, when he talks about lust? Um, all these things. So the Sermon on the Mount, you know, is still discussed today. Now, Jesus was a great man and a great teacher, and that endeared him to many secular leaders, such as Gandhi. Gandhi was a Hindu, um, and he thought that Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount were goals to strive for or strive for as you try to be a good person which makes sense as a hindu because you want to be a good person in this life so you're a better thing in the next life and eventually you you're just one with one of the gods or the god many emanations that they have anyway so you know makes sense for his thought that hey this is the things i have to do but the sermon on the mount uh it describes the life of a citizen of the kingdom of heaven Jesus went in preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so now he's describing what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. It's not a to-do list. People who see it as a list of goals to strive for miss the point entirely. In fact, many Christians miss the point. They think, okay, now I've become a Christian, I'm following Jesus, and, and here's how I'm supposed to live. I need to do these things. But in reality, yes and no, uh, in its essence, it describes what person who follows Jesus looks like, but that's because God's at work in your life, not because you're fighting your anger, you're fighting your lust. It is God at work in your life. So, <clears throat> and doing that is not going to get you right with God. The only thing that's going to get you right with God is a belief in Jesus. So, Jesus was a great man and a great teacher and was and still is God. And so the Sermon on the Mount are not about things we're supposed to try and do as if doing them earns us heaven points or something like that. I wish we earned heaven points. Wouldn't that be great? We can discuss rewards and stuff at a different time, but it is about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount are about the kingdom life, and as Christians, we are citizens. This is what our life should be. So all that said, when we become Christian, we're trading a life of sin for a life in the kingdom. And that change, again, is from God, not from us. The, the Beatitudes and Beatitude... Uh, as it says in you know, my Bible, probably yours, a little subheading, the Beatitudes, uh, means Beatitude is, is from the Latin meaning happy. Okay? Uh, why Latin? Well, because when Rome became a Christian nation, they translated the scriptures into Latin. So happy. The Beatitudes are about happiness. Um, where was I? They're not a checklist of to-dos, but a description of what life change from becoming a sinner to becoming a Christian, who is a saved sinner, uh, what that looks like. So for me, that change was from a very self-reliant, very goal-oriented, driven, me, me, me person to a broken man. And I don't just mean physically, we talked about that before, right? Uh, don't just mean physically broken either, although arguably that was part of the process for me. But no, I changed. Years ago, I was visiting with a childhood slash high school, which seems forever ago. A friend of mine, we hadn't seen each other in years, and uh, we were talking, you know, what's, what's going on, catching up. Well, now he was a gun store owner, and I was a pastor, and sometimes I still think he has the better gig, but <clears throat> neither of us were close to being what we were in high school. And he said to me, you know, I pride myself on having an almost photographic memory. And then he proceeded to tell me some of the stuff uh, from when I was a kid, which obviously I don't remember because I blocked that from my memory. I don't know why he didn't, but he remembered these things from long ago. And then he says, but I don't remember you being religious. I said, well, no, you're right. I wasn't. I didn't need God or religion or any of that stuff because I had the three most important people in the world in my life, me, myself, and I. 
And then one day, God did a funny thing. He opened my eyes and showed me how well that was not working for me. I had made a controlled mess of my life. I was a control freak, still have some of those issues, but this clarity of vision wasn't an intellectual thing. Like I didn't go, okay, here's my life today, and if I started following God and became a Christian, here's what my life would look like, and this way is much better than this. Um, that's true, but that's not how it came about. What happened was a heart change. I saw the things that I was doing for what they were, which is sin, crimes against God. The sin I was committing, that was breaking God's heart, and it began to break my heart as well. Every day we are faced with a choice of pursuing a holy, loving God or pursuing our own interests and comfort. God and his holiness, we and our selfishness. And we see this evidence by people in the world, right? They have seared consciences. They don't see right and wrong as the same, in the same light as those who have faced a holy and perfect God and recognize their sinful state. We see this in world leaders. They celebrate and applaud celebrities for proclaiming a choice to live in unrepentant sin. They tell them, I'm proud of you. We see this in uh, social media and how it's great to be famous and do silly things and stupid things and sinful things and get likes and clicks. This blindness to right and wrong comes from a heart that is hardened to what sin actually is and how God actually feels about it. However, if your eyes are open to the realization that a selfish life of sin can only lead to an eternity separated from God, the God who loves you enough to pursue you to the very end of his own life, then you are a changed person. God's love changes you. You start to want to live out what Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount in response to that love. God's love comes first. The kingdom life comes as a response. You're not trying to earn heaven points, or you're not trying to avoid punishment. You are responding to love. And when the person you've despised and rejected, you've spat in the face of, you've rebelled against, says, I love you, and I gave up my life for you, and I won't stop pursuing you, when you're faced with that kind of undeserved love, you turn from your rebellious attitude, and you accept that love and identify with that love and become a follower of Jesus. And when you start identifying with a God who loves you and created you, a God who is good and hates sin and injustice, then you also hate sin and injustice. Because you have been broken by his love and all you want is God and his love and you want it for everyone in the whole world. It's this change of heart, this new life in Christ that Jesus is talking about on the ser in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's look at it now. If you've opened your Bibles, you're at Matthew chapter 5. Let me pray and we'll begin. Father, as we go into uh, this wonderful, blessed teaching of life in the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount, open our eyes and ears and hearts to receive it, to see the truth, to hear the truth, to act upon and live out the truth that it contains, Lord. Help us to identify more and more with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, we closed out last week uh, with verse what is it, 25 of chapter 4, And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So he had been doing ministry in Galilee, and from the response of that, healing people, preaching about the kingdom, people from all around had come, had brought people who were sick to be healed, had listened to his teaching, and now they've all gathered, these big crowds. And seeing the crowds, Jesus goes up on this mountain, which wasn't special until Jesus preached this sermon. It's just a mountain in Galilee. And he sits down. Because when rabbis teach in a formalized manner, they sit. So this is a formal teaching that he's doing. He walked along with his disciples all over the place, and as he walked and taught, uh, that was you know informal discipleship. But this is formalized teaching. The disciples came to him, so the teachings primarily focused at them. But everyone there gets to hear it. And then in verse 2 it says, He opened his mouth, 
and taught them, which is just a way of saying that he taught them. It's used in the Old Testament several times. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now let's stop there for a moment and uh, look at this stuff. This is the beginnings of the Beatitudes. And again, the Beatitudes are not a checklist of things to do in order to be blessed, but rather they describe the person whose life has been changed by the gospel. Uh, blessed, again, uh, is blessed at happiness. In fact, some translations say that. Happy is the person. Happy is the person. But I'm, I'm blessed when I'm happy, so let's go with that. Blessed is the person whose life has been changed by the gospel. But how can you be happy, you ask, if you're poor in spirit, or mourning, or meek, or seeking righteousness? Well, starting with poor in spirit, that refers to a spiritual bankruptcy apart from Jesus Christ. Now, in certain Jewish strands of thought, poverty had a close association with piety or, or holiness, meaning the poorer you are, the more spiritual you are. And that makes sense. There's some truth, right? Jesus observed how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. If you have a roof over your head and clothes on your back and food in the pantry for a week's worth of feasting and money in the bank, why do you need God? You've got everything you can, everything you need to provide for yourself. But if you lack those things, in fact, if you've got nothing at all, not even something to look forward to, then your only hope is in the gospel, the good news. And although the gospel does spread quickly in communities or nations where poverty is the norm, poor in spirit does not mean materially poor. There's a close parallel. Spiritually bankrupt is like physically bankrupt, where you've got nothing left to rely on, nothing to feed or care for yourself with. You just can't do it yourself anymore. And that's really where I was when God called me into a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. Poor in spirit means you're empty. You've got nothing left on your own. It's very similar to the words I said, Lord, I messed this up. I can't do anything. If you take everything away, so be it. If you let me keep stuff, so be it. But either way, I surrender to you. I trust and will follow you. Those that are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we'll talk more about the kingdom of heaven beginning next week, I think. But realize the kingdom of heaven is pretty cool. It's the future, and it's now. It is hope, it is life, it is glory to God, it is peace, joy, love. It's everything that someone who is poor in spirit needs. So that is what a loving God gives them, making them blessed or happy. The next part of this happy life in the kingdom is the comfort that goes to those who mourn. Now you're thinking, I've lost loved ones and I mourn. It helped some, but it didn't give me a whole lot of comfort. He's not just talking about dead relatives. Remember, the citizen in the kingdom of heaven is not about you. Those things that make God sad make you sad. You mourn, you weep, you want comfort. Think beyond yourself. Does it make God happy that you still sin, even though Jesus died on the cross for you? No. It saddens him, and so it should make you sad too. Does it make God happy that babies die? No, it saddens him, so it should make you sad too. Those who mourn in the kingdom mourn because they realize their sinful state and the separation it causes between them and God. And God comforts them through the gospel. The gospel includes the promise now that you are forgiven through Jesus' work on the cross and the promise in the future that you'll have eternity to be with God. Those who mourn in the kingdom also mourn the injustices in the world, just as God does. The comfort is that Jesus will return and make all things right in the future and that he will work with those now who are willing to be his hands and feet in this world. And more on that in a second. But the next happiness or blessing goes to those who are meek. They shall inherit the earth. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Sorry. The greatest trio of rock and roll ever, Rush, Canadians band. It's a line from their song. And then, yeah, anyway. I'll play it for you sometime. It's good. It rocks. 
The meek shall inherit the earth. Well, a meek person is humble, gentle, not aggressive. How valued is that by the world today? Not so much, huh? If you're meek, doesn't that make you a target for someone who is aggressive? Are meek people respected in the world, or are the bold, loud, and arrogant people celebrated? Rich and famous is not meek. Meek is not made much of in this world, but that is what a citizen in the kingdom of heaven is, meek. And the earth they shall inherit as a global rule with Christ over an entirely recreated heavens and earth. Now before I get into verse 6, let me summarize, right? Those who recognize their sinful state in the presence of a holy God are poor in spirit. They mourn at their sor sorrowful state. They become meek and gentle in their humility because they see the grace and mercy and love of God. It changes their lives. It's no longer about you, but about God. You start seeing things from his perspective, and that's a big change. And you want to keep on changing and seeing him in more and more of the world. That leads us to verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, there's a, a duality here. Hunger and thirst, that equates with the poor who can't feed themselves. They shall be satisfied. The second hunger and thirst is God's righteousness. Happy are those who want to see God's standards established and obeyed in every area of life. That type of righteousness they will be satisfied. God promises that his purposes will be accomplished and that his justice will eventually reign. But again, he also wants to partner with us here and now to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At this point, I would invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 61. This is what Jesus preached in the synagogue in Nazareth that got him thrown out. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. There's some similar sounds and words there as to the beginning of the Beatitudes, right? Those who mourn will be comforted. When God grabs a hold of your heart and you surrender to him and the happiness of the Beatitudes describes your life and God's mourning is your mourning, you hunger and thirst for righteousness in this world, this passage in Isaiah is you. Just like Jesus said, this passage is fulfilled in your presence today. You become Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. Now, social media is full of people who proclaim their unrepentant sin and ask you to celebrate it with them. If you don't, you're labeled a hater, a bigot, a fascist, or worse. Why does that happen in the world? particularly in America? Why do we celebrate sub-biblical lifestyles? Why do we allow millions of babies to be murdered each year? Why are there homeless and hungry people on the streets of major cities? Why is there crime and injustice and corruption? Because the world is drowning in sin. And these people need Jesus. But what are the issues that break your heart? Chances are it breaks God's heart too. If you claim to be a Christian, if you have felt poor in spirit, in mourning, humbled by God's love, if you've desired to see things right in this world, then you are, as Isaiah said, an oak of righteousness. God has placed you where you are to grow up and be his planting in the world. Now, I know you guys have a few oak trees here in town. 
Uh, we lived in an area that had oaky grassland. That was the description of it. We had oak trees in our front yard, two of them, at our old house. And not every year, you guys can understand this, I'm sure, but, but some years they would rain acorns everywhere. And so I took some of those acorns and you have to, you know, do special things. You have to put them in the freezer for a while and do this and that, put them in a bucket. Those that float are, I think, no good. I don't remember what I did. But I took a couple of acorns, fallen from my tree, and planted them in buckets to grew to be saplings. It took years, but one of those was planted at our old church in the garden there. And eventually, I'll never see it, but eventually it will be this huge, ginormous tree. And it'll drop acorns and more trees and more trees and more trees. And this is the kind of thing, the image of an oak of righteousness. Maybe a little sapling, you in the back row, you in the front. And eventually, as your heart identifies more and more with God, and you desire more and more to see him in the world and to see things made right, you grow into this oak of righteousness that reproduces, and this is the kingdom. Like Jesus said, you know, it's this mustard seed, and it grows into this tree that birds can sit in. These oaks of righteousness will spread and become a forest, and eventually the whole world will be under God's reign. This is what we want, this is what we desire. And we don't all want the same thing, because God made us all individually different, right? Each of us has our own heart for some injustice in the world. When we see or hear news stories about it, or even see it happening in real life, it just burns us, right? Like we get angry, we want to do something about it. That's righteous anger. It's okay to be that kind of angry. Doing something about that is ministry. Ministry is not just a pastor who preaches. Ministry is not just teaching Sunday school. Ministry is serving in God's kingdom in all kinds of ways. And it may be going out and doing something. It may be serving ministry to the body of believers. We all have something to do in ministry. So what is the thing that ignites your flame of your ministry passion. Again, maybe it is serving the homeless, maybe it is helping with uh, unwanted pregnancies, unborn babies, maybe it is serving, feeding the poor, maybe it is making sure that the church family grows closer together. These are all ministries. Chances are, again, your hunger and thirst for righteousness is God calling you to do something about it, so do something. We're not saved to sit comfortably on the couch of Christianity. We are saved to become like Jesus, to share the gospel, to do the works God prepared beforehand for us to do. I'm going to leave you with a, a thought for this week. Is the Spirit of the Lord upon me? Does my life exhibit the characteristics of a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Honestly evaluate and answer those questions and pray for God to show you something that breaks your heart that you can do something about. Father, we thank you for all that you do and all that you are. Thank you for breaking our hearts of stone and giving us hearts of flesh, hearts that are turned towards you, hearts that want to serve you, hearts that want to honor and glorify you. Thank you for opening our eyes to see the things in the world that break your heart. Thank you for showing us ways to glorify you by serving you, by joining you in your work of growing this kingdom of heaven. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. Thank you for teaching us about the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for being the king. We love you. We thank you. We give you praise all in your name. Amen.